Welcome to The King's Table, a podcast out of King's Hill Church in Boston where we seek to elevate the Bible over opinion, answering the questions you have. I'm your host, Jonathan Mosley. Today's question is, how do I make decisions with God's glory in mind? Enjoy. Well, I just finished Amy Joseph's book, Demystifying Decision Making. Great book. I'd recommend it. Some of this podcast will come from me. Some of it will come from her. So you could think of this podcast as the Spark Notes version to that book. But in her book, she talks about this unseen dashboard that we all have when it comes to making decisions, especially big ones. And on this dashboard, there are different gauges. I want to list them out here because I think this is a great visual for the reality that's happening in our hearts and minds as we think about what actions to take. So she mentions four gauges. Within our dashboard, there is a cultural gauge. Now, we're naive to think that we're not in many ways a product of our own culture. Our thinking and feeling have profoundly been shaped by how we've been raised. Even in this idea of I can be anything I want to be, I'm free to be me, that actually is a cultural value impressed upon us by the West. So none of us are exempt from being culturally influenced. And Amy goes on to mention different types of cultural paradigms. There's the guilt innocence paradigm, the shame honor, and the fear power. In the first, this guilt innocence paradigm, there tends to be clear rules, we should say, for for right and wrong, things that are black and white. Moral responsibility is linked to the individual. Now, while there is great freedom within this paradigm, identity is derived from the individual, which ironically places a great deal of weight, sometimes even a paralyzing amount, on the individual when it comes to big decisions. (laughs) No wonder the West could be a, a culture that has a lot of anxiety disorders. We can be crippled when our future is always just up to us. And then there's the honor-shame culture. If individual freedom is the currency from guilt innocence, then obligation would be the currency for honor-shame. And in these cultures, decisions are evaluated by asking, will this bring honor or shame to my family or group? Now, there's pros or cons to this. Negatively, a person might feel a great deal of tension if their passions or gifts lead them away from their family. But positively, familial and social bonds tend to be very, very strong, more so than in a guilt-innocence type culture. And then there's the fear-power culture. And here, the unseen spiritual realms are important. And they have more of the focus than absolute truths or even ethical standards. There's an awareness of the transcendent. That's a good thing. But maybe a con would be that the dominant guiding factors tend to be signs or omens at the expense of logic. So this this gauge, the cultural gauge, is on every person's decision-making dashboard. Now, there's no right or wrong type culture. I'm simply saying that every person has this gauge on their dashboard. And each type of culture, whether it's guilt, innocence, honor, shame, fear, power, has both redemptive qualities to it and fallen sinful qualities to it. So that's the first gauge. The second gauge is the idolatry gauge. And again, everyone has this on their dashboard. An idol is something that we trust in or treasure more than God. It's what we look to to meet the deepest desires of our heart. And there are many idols. They can take many shapes and forms. For example, the relationship idol. I have meaning if a certain person is in love with me. The materialism idol. I have meaning by a certain level of health, financial freedom, nice possessions. The helping idol. I have meaning when others need me. The beauty idol. I have meaning if I look or feel beautiful. And so we look to people or things or appearances to, in effect, save us. That's why we call them an idol, because we look to them instead of God to save us. A person that loves us saves us from loneliness. A person that needs us saves us from uselessness, you see. But the problem goes beyond that. These are merely surface idols. 
There are deeper desires that drive us to these things or people. Let's call them source idols. This language is given to us by Tim Keller. This distinction between surface idols and source idols. And at the root, there's four source idols. Control, approval, power, and comfort. So let me illustrate how these idols are at play. To take the surface idol of materialism, for example, specifically money. You might be someone who likes the thought of a lot of money, but that's that's really not what's happening at the source. What, what's the source? What's, what's driving our hearts to attach itself to money? Well, if comfort is the source idol, then you might say, I'll have meaning if I have a certain amount of money in the bank because I get a sense of restfulness when I think about what I'll be able to buy with it and enjoy with it. But if approval is the source, you might say, I know others will respect and appreciate me if I have a good amount of money to spend on them and myself. Others will notice my success and think highly of me. If control is the source idol, then you would say, you know, a lot of money makes me feel self-sufficient and independent. If there's a problem, I'll be able to deal with it. If power is the source idol, then you'll say, the status that money brings will make me a person someone will want to seek out for counsel and advice. I will have more influence on others. You see, one surface idol could actually have multiple source idols. The point I'm trying to make, though, is when it comes to decision making, we have to know our idols. We all have them, and they have a profound impact on how we make decisions in everyday life. I've seen comfort drive people to the wrong relationship. Out of a desire for approval, I've seen students want to please their parents by declaring a certain major in school, though they have no interest in it. I've seen people spend money on nice things because at the root, they like the attention and respect and influence that comes with it. So you get the picture. Idols influence our decisions. And that's going to be a big gauge on the dashboard of our decision making. But there's also the desire gauge. Pleasure and desires are not wrong in and of themselves. Emotions should not be dismissed as part of the decision making process. But with that said, we should be careful with the secular creed of just follow your heart. <laughs> we should allow our emotions to play a part in our decisions to the, to the degree that they are sanctified desires. More on this later. You see, understanding the factors that shape us, it helps us in our decision-making process. It's important to know what's at play. But practically, how do we know if we're, as it relates to this dashboard and the different gauges that are on it, how do we know if we're hanging on to the redemptive parts of our cultural upbringing and not hanging on to the fallen qualities of our cultural upbringing, our cultural gauge? How can we overcome the power of the idolatry gauge when it seems to be in high gear? Or how can we make sure the desires and emotions that we're feeling have God at the center and not self. How can we lean into making sure that our decisions are glorifying God? Well, Amy talks about making decisions like putting pieces of the puzzle together. And she gives us several pieces I want to talk about here. One is passions. Another is priorities. Another is the people of God. Another is providential circumstances. And also the peace of the Holy Spirit. Now, to honor her alliteration, let me add the cornerstone, the most important, which is this, namely the pages of Scripture. I want to start there because in our decision dashboard, we need to let the pages of Scripture have overdrive power and complete control. Every culture will have aspects that can be redeemed, that can be affirmed, but also aspects that need to be rejected. And how do we know which ones to affirm and reject? or challenge, well, it comes from the Bible. For example, the Bible affirms family and the command to honor your parents. Now, in an honor-shame culture, this is often the deciding factor. What does my family think? But the Bible corrects that thinking because sometimes what God is calling us to might not be what our parents would prefer or like. But also take, for example, the guilt-shame culture. Their autonomy, independence, are driving influences, which is not bad, but the Bible corrects that thinking too. 
because decisions should not be made in a vacuum. They should be done by consulting godly counsel. So the pages of scripture help draw out the strengths and faults of our own cultural biases. Uh, The pages of scripture also sanctify our desires. They train my desires to follow God. Consider the words of Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Here's, here's an illustration. Say I, I just adopted a puppy. For me, it's going to be a, a mini husky. And I want to take him on a walk with me around the city of Boston. Am I going to put that dog on a, le- a leash? You better believe it because I, I can't trust that dog to follow me yet. That dog will run right out in the middle of the street. <laughs> no, I need to make sure that that puppy matures, learns the master's voice. That puppy needs to be trained. Now, when it comes to my emotions, to my desires, God intends for them to be used when it comes to making decisions, but we need to make sure that they've been informed, influenced, molded, dare we say trained by scripture. All scriptures breathed out, trains us for righteousness. This means that I am allowing my heart to be steeped in scripture. Heart formation does not happen without making Scripture a close friend, without spending time in the Bible. If you think of an XY axis, if you could visualize with me, the X axis being what is urgent, the Y as being what's important, whatever is urgent tends to get our attention. Sometimes it gets our attention even when it's not important, right? The, The tyranny of the urgent principle is a real thing. But tending to the important, even when it doesn't seem urgent, is vital. I think oftentimes Bible reading is in this category. We don't necessarily take it as urgent. We should, but we don't always take it as urgent. But it's extremely important. The small daily decisions of reading our Bible form habits. And habits shape our lives so that we're ready and prepared to make big decisions when they come. We cannot follow the will of God without knowing the word of God. So the corner piece, so to speak, as we think about the puzzle pieces to pull together as we aim to make decisions that glorify God is actually knowing what glorifies God revealed to us in the pages of scripture. Secondly, another puzzle piece that we're thinking about would be our passions. We're taking inventory of how God has gifted us, the passions God has given us. God has made us each uniquely with a purpose. The fact that I enjoyed playing sports growing up while my wife enjoyed playing instruments, that difference is not bad. One's not better than the other. Different is just different. God has made us with diverse interests. He's bestowed on us diverse gifts, designed us with diverse passions. And we should take the way God has crafted us and made us into consideration when it comes to making decisions. Third would be priorities. One way of speaking of priorities is thinking about the stage of life that you're in. For example, what's important to me at 20 may not be all that important to me at age 40. At age 40, I may not want to or be able to step into something that's physically demanding. But also, if God's blessed me with a family, the priority of family life may trump a higher paying salary if it means less time with my spouse or kids, or maybe if that job means relocating, which could hurt my kids socially. So you see, there's lots of factors. Stage of life should be taken into consideration. A good question that Amy suggests is this. What are the critical roles in our lives in this season? That's one way of thinking about priorities. But maybe even an even more significant way of thinking of priorities is this. Does this put the kingdom of God first? That's the challenge that Jesus gives us. Seek first the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells us in John 15 what the purpose of life is. If someone were to ask you, what's the purpose of life? Well, that answer is in John 15. We're to have our joy made full as we abide in Christ and then bear fruit that glorifies God. Bearing fruit means that we grow in godliness. It means that we love our brothers and sisters in need. It means that we attempt great things for God, knowing we have a glorious God who guides us. It 
Bearing fruit means that by the Holy Spirit's power that I'm increasing in the virtues of Christ, namely love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Bearing fruit means I am ambitious, but ambitious to serve others and bring God glory to the nations. That's what Jesus means by bearing fruit. Now, what might be some questions that have God's kingdom in mind? Questions that aim to put the kingdom first. I'll give you several. To be honest, it's probably a different metric you're used to. But here are some good questions that you could be thinking about that aim at putting the kingdom of God first. Take, for example, these questions. Will this decision, whatever it is, put pressures and demands on me that hinder my availability to God and my faithfulness to his word? Will this decision, whatever it is, be considered wise when this vapor of a life is over and I stand before God and give an account to what I did with what he gave me? Does this decision open me up for greater gospel impact? How will this decision play a part in the growing of my holiness? Now, to be more specific, say it's a decision over a job. Questions you might ask would be, will the environment of this job and its activities shape me or will I be able to shape it in ways that make much of Christ? What's the spiritual climate of the city with with which I might move to, depending on the job offer? Is that place reached with the gospel? And if it is really reached with the gospel, have I considered another location where there might be a greater gospel need? How am I choosing housing if I stay or go somewhere? Is it close to the church that I'm going to be a member at? Are there good opportunities to interact with my neighbors? Is this job open to me sharing my faith or starting a Bible study? So those are specific kingdom first questions as it relates to a job. What about a relationship? Some questions you could ask would be, does this person have a willingness to do whatever the Lord asks, whatever the Lord says to do, however the Lord says he wants it done? Will this person be a sparring partner for me, forever committed to sharpening me to grow in Christ's likeness? Does this person take the picture and roles of marriage presented in Ephesians 5 seriously? So these are examples. But basically, what I'm saying is, am I making a decision that aligns with the priorities of God? That's the point. What are the priorities of God that are laid out in Scripture? Well, my holiness, the evangelism of the lost, my connection and involvement to the local church, and the exaltation of Jesus. When I'm thinking about making a decision, am I thinking about those things? Because that's the priorities that God in his word lays out for me. Fourthly, another piece of the puzzle when it comes to making decisions would be the people of God. We say a lot at Kings Hill, The people of God and the word of God keep us close to God. God has designed it so that his wisdom that he wants to give us comes from the fountain of scripture, but also from his people that have the Holy Spirit inside of them. We need to have people in our lives that we can seek counsel from in times when we face big decisions. Can we not be an update person Instead, can we be a feedback person? (laughs) Maybe you're asking, what's the difference? Well, an update person goes to their mentor, goes to that friend that they deem godly, and they say to them, hey, just want to give you an update. I've decided to do this. (laughs) But a feedback person says, hey, this is what I'm thinking about. Am I missing anything? What do you think? You see, a feedback person invites the wisdom of God into their lives. You see, often we have blind spots in our decision-making process. There are idols within our hearts buried deep, and we need mature, seasoned, Jesus-loving mentors and friends to inquire, to probe, and yes, even at times challenge us. God has given us a community as a safety net for the big decisions that we make. After all, we're told that there is safety in an abundance of counselors, Proverbs 11, 14. I need people who know me, 
my weaknesses, my defaults, my sin struggles, and at the same time know and love and cherish the gospel. And to know those people that are able to apply the scripture to the hearts of people. They're in essence gospel fluent because they know how to speak the gospel to temptations, struggles, circumstance, future decisions. Amy in her book calls these people trusted trespassers. <laughs> in other words, you give them permission to ask the hard questions, to share the truths that sometimes we don't want to hear. We intentionally invite them into praying and fasting, not after a decision has been made, but to help us seek an answer to a decision that we're after. And ideally, these would be people of different backgrounds and life seasons. Fifthly, as it relates to putting the puzzle pieces together when making decisions that glorify God, looking for providential circumstances. Put simply, do we sense that God is opening a door or closing a door? Have you been able to trace his guidance on what you feel he's asking you to do? Is there a subtle piece that God has said no or yes by the subjective reality of your circumstances? That's what we mean by providential circumstances. It doesn't mean that every open door is the right one, nor does it mean that it's not God's will to soon open a closed door after a prolonged season of waiting or time of prayer. But it does mean when we say, by, when we say providential circumstances, it means that we can say with conviction, God it really seems that you're lining things up here for me to move forward in faith in this direction. That's what we mean by providential circumstances. And finally, sixthly, that final piece of the puzzle when it comes to making decisions, do we have peace from the Holy Spirit? Now, I want you to notice that I've listed this last. That's because feelings are not ultimate in the decision-making process. First are the pages of Scripture. That's the cornerstone. And from the pages of Scripture, we're told what the priorities of God are. But as a final piece of the puzzle, not the first, but as a final piece, do we sense there's inner peace from God as we're thinking about what's next? When I'm considering a yes or no to a decision that's in front of me, do I feel more a desolation, a anxiousness, a despair, or do I feel a consolation, a comfort, an ease? Now, not ease of circumstances, not ease of the road God's calling me to walk down. What I'm talking about here is a consolation, a comfort of the soul. It means that as I weigh an option, and I'm, I'm, I'm chewing on if I were to say yes to it, or I'm chewing on whether I'd say no to it. One way or the other, do I feel a sense of resoluteness or assurance by the Holy Spirit to which path he's asking me to take? That's what we mean by the peace from the Holy Spirit. So if you're into alliteration, you got your fix today. <laughs> what are the pieces of the puzzle when it comes to decision making? The pages of scripture, the priorities of gospel advancement, people of God, providential circumstances, and peace from the Holy Spirit. And if you aim to put these pieces of the puzzle together, you will glorify God in the decisions He's guiding you to make. I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion around glorifying God in our decisions. Glad you could join us at the King's Table. If you'd like more information or resources from Kings Hill Church, you can visit us online at www.kingshillboston.com.